Welcome to Forgiving Challenge, a life-changing 40-day journey leading to freedom. So many of us talk about freedom, we want freedom, and yet my fear is that many of us, even who follow after God, aren't really experiencing the freedom that Jesus has won for us. And so I'm so excited to journey with you on these 40 days as we find out and discover what freedom in Jesus is all about. Today we're starting here at Florida National Cemetery. This is a place that honors those who have fought for our freedom that we experience in this nation. And, and when I come to a place like this, it reminds me that there is a great cost to freedom. There's a great price to freedom. And, and so many have paid that price. In fact, just a couple of months ago, we lost a dear friend in our church family named Frank Kipp, who was a 95-year-old veteran who fought for our freedom. And he had a service at this very location. One of the amazing parts about Frank's story is he fought all the way back in World War II, even in the Battle of the Bulge in 1944. And during that battle, as he and his unit were sweeping mines, there was one that went off and tragically uh, killed a lot of the people in his unit and left Frank with shrapnel in his body the rest of his life, earning him the nickname Buckshot Frank. Frank often wondered, even though he had those injuries, like why of all people would God spare him? And those of us who knew Frank knew it was because God wasn't done with him. And, and Frank went on to be literally one of the greatest servants of Jesus I've ever met. And while we celebrate Frank and those who've gone before us as great heroes that have fought for our freedom in this nation, I want to talk in these 40 days about a freedom that really is more on the inside. It's a, a spiritual freedom. And the amazing thing about this freedom is that Jesus has already won the freedom for us. This freedom, there's already been a battle that's taken place. And this is a freedom that Jesus offers to each and every one of us. And yet, my fear is that many of us aren't experiencing this. We'll quote John 8, 36 all day long, who the Son has set free is free indeed all day long. And yet many of us aren't experiencing that full and abundant life that Jesus promises, that, that freedom that comes with meaning and purpose and fulfillment alongside of it. Over these next 40 days, we're going to discover what real freedom in Jesus looks like. So as we journey into 40 days of freedom, it all starts with the idea that the same God of the universe that placed the stars and planets in the sky, that intimately thought and created you before you were even born, actually has forgiven you and loves you. And what's amazing about God is Jesus will show us time and time and time again this very truth. Like he did on the night of the resurrection, the story's recorded in John chapter 20. It tells us that the disciples were quarantined in a room that night out of fear of what the leaders in the government would do to them. And amazingly, in that quarantined room, Jesus mysteriously kind of bursts through the wall. And, and, and that's my prayer in this series, is that Jesus kind of mysteriously reveals himself to you over the course of these days as well. And, and there's so many amazing things about this story. Like, let's not forget the main thing, that a man who was once dead is now alive again. But what happened was Jesus revealed his nail-scarred hands to the disciples, and they believed in him again. And, but I've always thought, and it's curious to me, like, why would the resurrected, glorified body of Jesus have scars still on his hand? Like, scars seem like defects, and you would expect in our glorified state that we would have a body without blemishes. Like, what's going on with that? And as I started thinking about it a little bit more, I, I realized that I have scars, and likely if you've lived a year or two, you have scars too. And there's one particular scar, there's a little one right underneath my chin that's really meaningful to me. And, and you probably won't even notice, even you who've bought the 8K QLED latest and greatest TVs, I don't even know if you'll notice it's there. But this one for me reminds me of July 31st, 2001. So it's 20 years ago in my story, and that for me was the summer between high school and college, and I was really trying to figure out what I was going to do in life. And, and what you don't know about my story is that up until that point a few years ago, I really felt like God placed a call on my life to serve Him in ministry and to become a pastor. And, and I would be a fourth generation Zender pastor. Except I kind of started to run from that and I didn't really want to do that. And I, I really liked sports and broadcasting and journalism. And I, I loved the Cleveland Browns. And I thought maybe that's my dream job, working with the Browns. And now that I look back after the 20 years, thank you God for saving me from doing that. But hey, this is the year. And so as I was kind of trying to figure out what to do in life, 
as I was driving in on that day, July 31st, 2001, my family was at a reunion in Angola, Indiana, and I was with my older brother and two cousins. We just hit some golf balls on the driving range, and I was kind of blindly following somebody back to our rental home. And unfortunately, the person I was following ran a stop sign, and I didn't have time to catch it, and I also ran that stop sign. And I was blindsided by a pickup truck that hit me right in the driver's side door going 60 miles an hour. Immediately my car spun out and went into the median and I was knocked out of consciousness. The next 20, 30 minutes was really blurry for me, but I remember not being able to move and then all of a sudden looking up and this large machine called the Jaws of Life was there ripping and prying the door open so they could get me out. And so they pulled me out and they threw me onto a stretcher and rolled me into the ambulance and we headed to the hospital. And all of that I actually felt pretty good and it turns out a couple of hours later they released me from the hospital and there was only two things that I, I received that day. Number one, I received a ticket for running a stop sign. I'm like, man, I didn't even try to break the law. But number two, this little scar underneath my chin, probably from when I hit the airbag. But this scar represents for me a second chance because it was that night that I got by my bedside and I kneeled and I thanked God for sparing my life for giving me a second chance. And I vowed to God to do my able best that with whatever life I had left, I would serve him. And while it hasn't always been perfect, uh, I enrolled in pastoral ministry the very next week and spent nine years of education before my dream of becoming a pastor finally came to fruition. And it's been such a blessing over the last decade to lead uh, and pastor a church in Florida. But for me, this scar represents July 31st, 2001, the second chance that God gave to me. And so if that's what my scar means, as we enter back into the story of Jesus, why would Jesus have scars? Like, is there something God wants to tell us through the nail-scarred hands of Jesus? So there was one disciple that was not in the room that original night. His name was Didymus. All right, he's also known as Thomas, and typically he's known as Doubting Thomas, as a pastor that likes alliteration. I've always wondered why Doubting Didymus didn't stick. And so why wasn't he there? Did he miss the memo? Well, did you miss my Didymus pun that I just did? Anyway, it's okay if you did. I, I forgive you. This whole thing's about forgiveness. And so Thomas wasn't there, and we say it's because he doubted. And no doubt we say that because a verse earlier says that Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, I will not believe. And so amazingly, one week later, Jesus shows up in that same room, disciples quarantined in fear again, but this time Thomas is with them, comes through the wall and he directs right to Thomas and he says, Thomas, put your hands in my side and look at the scarred hands of mine. And from that moment on, Thomas believed. And what's amazing about his story is he went from doubting Didymus to a devoted disciple. Thomas would become the first missionary to the nation of India and would actually be martyred for his faith. And that's the ability and the power of the scars of Jesus. They have the ability to mark us and change us forever from the inside out. What do the scars of Jesus tell us? A story of an innocent, perfect, holy man that went to the cross to die a death that we deserve to die. The prophet Isaiah says that Jesus took this pain upon us, took this suffering upon us, that he was crushed for our iniquities and pierced for our transgressions, but that ultimately, he says, we are healed by his wounds. And so have you been healed through the wounds of Jesus? Have you allowed his marks on his hands to forever mark you as God's child? Have you received what God really wants to give you through these nail scarred hands? And that's this beautiful gift of grace. And so this is what we're looking at in these 40 days is are the nail scarred hands of Jesus, have they marked you forever with his grace?
I'm so excited to journey these 40 days of forgiveness with you. I want to tell you two things that I think are going to shape the rest of the 40 days in the upcoming videos. And the first is this word scars. Not only is it going to be, I think, a powerful metaphor that we'll jump back into, but it's also going to form a really great acronym for us describing what I believe are the five phases of freedom. And so we're going to look at each letter in scars. And so it begins next video with sin. The fact that we all miss the mark. And it's not a question of if we will, but when we do, what do we do after we sin? This is where God then invites us to a pro practice called confession, where we bring our sins to God. And when we bring our sins to God, he is faithful and he forgives us. He does it through his words of absolution, this declaration that you have been forgiven and the price has been paid in full by the blood of Jesus. But Jesus's forgiveness is even better than that. It also invites us back into a life of restoration, where he restores our identity. And this is one that so many of us struggle with today. And then finally, he invites invites us into a life of sanctification. This is literally the process of where we become free, where we participate with God in a life of meaning and purpose. And so we'll jump back into that acronym each week. The other thing you need to know is we're going to look deeply into the story of another disciple that was in the room on each of those nights. His name was Peter, and what I love about Peter is he's the only other fully developed character in the Gospels outside of Jesus. And I love the stories of Jesus forgiving people all throughout the Gospels, but my favorite story of forgiveness is how Jesus forgives Peter because it's so relational, it's so powerful. And so we're going to look into this story each and every week and see how carefully and methodically and specifically and, and graciously Jesus is going to forgive. Peter to restore him and to invite him into a life of meaning and purpose. And that at the end of the day is what freedom is really about. It's one more thing of why I'm excited to be here at this cemetery. And when I'm, when I'm here, I, I see that each one of our lives truly does matter and that our life, believe it or not, will end. Your life will end and my life will end. And the amazing thing is that God invites us to live lives of meaning and purpose right now, that our stories do matter in fact. And what's amazing about our stories is that Jesus is not only the author of our stories, not only the finisher of our stories, but he is the hero of our stories. And he's what real forgiveness and what real freedom is all about. And so let's journey together and find out more about forgiveness.